Welcome to Ambo TV. Each week we bring you dynamic sermons from next generation pastors from across the country. And as always, they're bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. And then we discuss them right here in studio. As always, I'm your host, Dean, hashtag Blessed Windsor. And Happy New Year, by the way. Uh, happy Decade as well. We're back with a new show, great sermons from Florida, Georgia, and Washington. And first up is Pastor Corey Demo of Cape Christian Church in Cape Coral, Florida. And his sermon is called Mastermind Success. And he's helping us start the new year right with some tools for a successful life. And then we'll be in Forsyth, Georgia at Mountain Lake Church with Pastor Nathan Castleberry. And he's speaking from the sermon topic of Act Local, Think Global. If you're a business guy, you might have heard of this before. And he wants us to focus on what it means to live the gospel at the local and global level. Sounds kind of cool. Lastly, we're in Vancouver, Washington with Pastor Daniel Fusco, and we all love the way he says God at Crossroads Community Church. His message is called The Light Embraced, and he's encouraging us to walk in the light of God and tells us how to do that exactly. And I'll be joined in studio by Pastor Emmanuel Barlow from Excelling Church in the Bronx, and he's here to help me break down these really cool messages. But first, I want to get to Cape Carl, Florida with Pastor Corey Demo. Let's go ahead and check him out. Success is a product of how we invest our time and energy, how we invest our time and energy or our work. Uh, our, our work is, is one of the ways that we, we figure that out. Um, what do you do with what you've been given? If you've been in this church a while, last July, we did a series called Welcome to the Jungle. If you're new and you want to know kind of where we come from and, and what, what we're about, that would be a great series to walk through. I take four weeks and walk through the, just the very beginning of the story in Genesis to kind of create the narrative for the whole story. Um, and, uh, and we talk about this because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we see this idea. This is before Adam and Eve have taken the apple or the fruit. It's before sin has entered into the world. It's before there's been separation from God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. What we learn here is that work was created by God. After God created everything, he says, I'm gonna put you in a garden, I'm gonna place you in a context, and I want you to work it, and I want you to manage it, and I want you to use what I've given you, and I want you to make it fruitful and multiply it. That was, the, that was God's instruction. And it's worth noting, this happened before sin had entered into the world, because sometimes I think we think that, that work is just a byproduct of sin. Well, if Adam wouldn't have eaten the apple, I wouldn't have to go to work tomorrow. Well, that's not true. The difference is if Adam wouldn't have eaten apple, you wouldn't have, looked, you wouldn't have hated going to work tomorrow. You would have looked forward to it. That's the difference. But work was God's idea because he wants us to partner with him in creating and ruling and, and being fruitful and multiplying. And so at the very beginning, we see I, I got, God's like, I'm going to put you here and I want you to have a relationship with me. And then while you're here, I got something for you to do. I want you to make it awesome. Biblical success is working diligently here and now, both the, the servant with five talents and the servant with two talents were industrious. They, they used what the master gave them, and they, re, they gained more of a profit. They gained more back. Um, there's a brilliant, beautiful quote by John Calvin uh, that, that really, really captures this that I want to I wanna show you and I want to talk about for a minute because I think if, if, honestly, if we just get this, I think it will change our perspective. It will change our approach to life, to parenting, to work, to all kinds of things. And so I want to share with you what John Calvin said. Um, he, goes, he, he says this about the idea of stewardship and success and working and, and, and basically everything we're talking about. He says this, the idea of calling or vocation is first and foremost about being called by God to serve him within his world, to serve him within his world. It's simply that. This next one is so good. Work was thus seen as an activity by which Christians could deepen their faith. When was the last time you woke up on a Monday morning? You already know where I'm going. <laughs> and you went, I can't wait to go to work today because I am going to sharpen and strengthen my faith. Today, I'm going to be around so many crazy, hedonistic, out of control people that the only way I will make it is if I strengthen my character, strengthen my integrity, and strengthen my faith. If I try to live like them, I will lose. 
I will strengthen my, what, when, when, when was the last time we went to work and went, I can't wait for God to, to develop my patience today, to, for, to develop my forgiveness today, to develop my turn the other cheek mentality today, to help me to not be so judgmental of those who live differently than me, to teach me how to love other people who are different than me, to teach me how to love difficult people, because everything I just said is all the stuff Jesus didn't taught. Every single day, when we go into our workplaces, most of us, even some of us who work at churches, we have the opportunity to develop our character and change the way we think so that we can become more like who we're meant to be. When, what if, what if, what if, what if, just call me crazy. What if we all went to work this week, not with like, oh my gosh, I hate my job, I hate my boss, I don't get paid enough, like, oh my gosh, I just hate this. What if instead of that mentality, we went to the same job with the same crazy people, went to the same school with the same crazy people and the same crazy teachers or whatever and said, God, I, I got 40 to 56 hours this week where you can, <laughs> just seeing if you're still awake, where you can actually deepen my faith, where in a world that's broken and looking for hope, I can actually act counterculture. I can be like the kingdom. I can be someone who loves and forgives and shows grace. And even though most of the people in my job are gonna take the path of least resistance and do the least amount that's asked, I'm gonna go the extra mile. I'm gonna do more that's asked. I'm gonna help people to get, succeed in their job even though I don't get paid. I'm gonna be a team player. What if, just imagine now, all of a sudden, every moment has purpose. Everything has purpose. I can't wait to go to work to deepen my faith. I can't wait to serve my boss because I remember one time Jesus said, well, how easy is it to serve somebody who loves you? Even the Pharisees can do that. Even the heathens can do that. I can't wait to go serve my boss who is a tyrant and he's never gonna thank me and he's never gonna notice. Yes, Pastor Corey Demo, Pastor Emmanuel here. Look, I, I wanna jump in because mm -hmm. he's talking about this four letter word that seems like so it's like nothing when we're younger, yeah. but as we get older, it becomes like almost like a curse. You yeah. work, it, it's a thing. Some people don't really ever want to work. Some people love their jobs. So this, this weirdness of us kind of, you know, hating our jobs, is, it, is that God's way of kind, of kind of like letting us work things out on our own? Or is it more of a, we're just, we're trying to force ourselves into things we don't like doing just in order to get a paycheck? I think that what Pastor Corey Demo was trying to get us to understand is that um, sometimes if you're frustrated at work or frustrated with your work, mm -hmm. it's because you're not working to your full potential, mm. right? Okay. Um, he stated that work was then seen as an activity by which Christians can deepen their faith, right? Mm -hmm. And he talked about what if we went to work on Monday and said, you know what? I got 40 hours this week to show someone the love of Jesus. Oh, okay. I've got 40 hours to serve someone and, and, and show them the light. I've, the Bible says that we are walking epistles to be read of men daily, right? And so part of the reason why we get so frustrated with work or having to go to work is because we don't find the enjoyment in it anymore. Mm. And what greater way to find enjoyment than to share your faith? That's evangelism 101. Yeah, and I know exactly what you're saying. This, that's why this is such a good topic because I feel like this is something that everyone struggles, struggles with, whether it's work or school or, you know, we all get frustrated. So are you basically saying that mm -hmm. if we keep God in our lives more and, and focus on God more that our you know, the job that makes someone maybe miserable or, you know, something that doesn't make you feel good, it could actually be something you look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two scriptures come to mind. Okay. In Hit all me. thy ways, acknowledge him and okay. he shall direct your path. Okay. And I will keep them whose mind is stayed on me in mm. perfect peace, right? All right. That perfect peace is, is, is serious because what should be aggravating me is not. Mm. I love it. All right. So look, people, keep your attention on God. Perfect peace. It, it can happen for you. And maybe the job won't seem so miserable after all. And we're going to go ahead, take a break and be right back with more Pastor Emmanuel and Ambo TV.
Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Corey Demel, but right now, I want to get to Pastor Nathan Castleberry. Let's go ahead and check him out. In ancient Rome, individual freedom and instant pleasure and power was, was part of the playbook. Christianity and this way of life did not mesh. So there were riots that were formed against the Christians. They wanted to kick Paul out. They wanted to end the infestation of Christianity. They wanted to do whatever they could to get rid of these people. Uh, Eric and I used to live in South Florida, and we lived near the Everglades for a little while, and, and we were told by the local government there was this infestation of this one particular lizard known as a river monitor. And when I saw this in the first time, it was more like a dinosaur than a lizard. And I understood why they viewed this thing as a threat to the environment. It was just growing rapidly, and if you're driving along in the Everglades on the Florida Turnpike, you would swear you saw the Leviathan swimming in the, in the swamp next to you. Like, these weren't just the little lizards. And so the Florida government was doing whatever they could to just get rid of this infestation. Well, the Ephesian government was working with the silversmiths because Christianity was growing so rapidly that it was putting a dent in the silver industry. Why the silver industry? Because the silver guild was responsible for creating idols of Artemis, the fertility god. Christianity was growing at such a great, great intensity that the temple of Artemis, the seventh wonder of the world, was declining in attendance and the silver industry was declining in business. They wanted to do something about it, but it couldn't be stopped. Twelve people, through local obedience, had an impact on two million. You see, these Early church members knew the Great Commission had an implication. Everything I do, every story I tell, every interaction I have, every gift that I share, every person I come in contact with is, is a local responsibility that could have global repercussions. They knew that they had to act local, but think global. And that's how the gospel uncontrollably spread like wildfire. Now, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if there was a letter written to this group of a dozen or so pastors and deacons and, and church leaders that, that God used to, to catalyze a movement that would reach an entire country with the good news of Jesus? Wouldn't it be amazing if, if Paul maybe wrote a memoir, about six chapters to these Ephesians and, and they got canonized in our New Testament where we could look and see what were they doing? How did they act? How did they conduct themselves? What was happening inside of this original house church that would cause an entire nation to hear about Jesus? Well, I'm so glad you asked because we've got that right here. Just a few short chapters after the book of Acts, we have the book of Ephesians where it's Paul's instructions to maintain the momentum and what it looks like to find your place in the body of Christ, what it looks like to act locally but think globally, what it means to engage in this process of witnessing and making disciples and going to the nations. It all came down to a a local obedience with a, with, a, with a global mindset. The early Christians did whatever they could to point people to Jesus. They lived in such a way that demonstrated that Jesus really was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, Pastor Nathan, look, man, I, I'm, I'm digging what he's saying here. This ain't a country club. Like, this is, this is not box seats to the Lakers. Like, this is open door, this is God's house. That's the news, that, that's the good news, that's what we should be spreading. So, you know, th th there has to be different ways though because I know people are kind of apprehensive. Nobody wants to shove scripture in someone's face. You know, th there's a lot of people that take that non or that kind of passive approach. Like, to me, I like if somebody's like, yo, I love those kicks that you got on or yo, I, I love your car. I'm like, yeah, dude, hey, look, like God helped me get in that. Let's, let's talk about it. Like, what are some good ways that people can kind of you know, help bring others into the fray without constantly quoting scripture? Because that might not be somebody's thing. No, no, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting. Um, there was one day I was out with some friends. Okay. And um, one of my friends was getting ready to take a picture. And these two individuals jumped in the picture. Okay. Now, we're New Yorkers. Yeah. So in our mind, it's like, yo, who, who, yeah, what who are, are you? you doing? Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> but um, a friend of mine decided to take that opportunity and show them some kindness. Okay. Right? So then we all ended up taking a group, a group picture. 
And in taking that group picture, we were able to ask, well, where are you from? Found out that they were from Australia. Wonderful. Oh, wow. So then my friend goes, well, do you know about the Hillsong Church in Australia? Oh, yeah, I love that. That was the segue okay. to really sharing our faith with them. I love that. Sharing what we believe. Yeah. Whereas if we had done that whole New York thing, like, yo, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We would have lost that opportunity. Yeah. I love that. So basically, there's opportunities everywhere we look. It doesn't always just have to be scripture. And uh, with that being said, really quickly, I want to go ahead and jump to Pastor Daniel Fusco in Washington. Let's go ahead and see what he has to say today. But it does bear to be repeated over and over and over again that God is light. And it says that God is light and in God there's no darkness at all. So the idea of God being light, what it means is that in the very person or the very nature of God, there is nothing that would pertain to darkness. And, and in this sense, it means anything that is evil, anything that is impure, anything that is unholy. So the light-darkness paradigm is being used here to speak about God and God's perfections. Now, the reason we need to repeat it, of course, is because sometimes life wants to tell you that God is, has some darkness within him. That sometimes your circumstances, or we live in a culture that says, this is why God, if God is real, God is not good. And I'm here to tell you, the word of God tells us that God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. Now, at that point, you either trust the word of God or you trust the way you choose to interpret the events of your life. Like, if you think about the worst possible things that go on in the world, mo a lot of people, not most people, but a lot of people interpret those events to say, there is darkness in God. If there is a God, God is not good. And many of us have had that thought, haven't we? But when we, just because we have those thoughts, our job in life is not to believe everything that you think. Our job in life is to take the things that we think and weigh them against the word of God. And the word of God says that God is pure light. God is good all the time. There is no darkness in God at all. You notice those two words? There's no darkness at all. And what that means for us then is that in looking at the situations that you find yourself in and in looking at the circumstances of the world in which we live in, that we always have to keep in mind that no matter what the circumstances are, God is light. And there is no darkness in God. God's ways are always perfect, especially when they don't make any sense to us. Jesus said it this way, speaking about God being light. John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. How powerful is that? God who is light and in him is no darkness at all. That God came and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. And that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? It's the God who is light coming to in habit a world that is full of darkness. See, one of the most, when you think about the coming of Jesus, obviously we realize that Jesus is, as, a, as the church, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, God coming and dwelling in the midst of a humanity that he created and who, that he sustains every day. And then ultimately we celebrate the, the resurrection season, the crucifixion of Jesus and then his resurrection, which is the climactic moments in the life of Jesus. And when you think about Jesus on the cross, was there ever a time when you would think to yourself, man, darkness has won out? When the Son of God is crucified, the only perfect person, the only person who never did anything wrong is being crucified as a seditious traitor by the Roman Empire. You think, oh man, darkness won out. It's God's greatest triumph, isn't it? Man, this is one of the hardest questions and most common questions, really, either from a child mm -hmm. or from someone who's secular. You know, it's how is God good, pure light, 
but also sometimes can seem to get a little dark. You know, how do you approach an answer to that question when it's posed to you? The I know reality, it's a tough one. I'm no, sorry. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the reality of the matter is we've all gotten to a point where it's like, God, if you're so awesome, yeah. why is this happening? Uh -huh. um, and then it really comes down to a faith thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to believe that when God says that all things are going to work together, and here we go back to the work part, right? Uh -huh. Because we seem to think that when the Bible says that all things are going to work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, that that means that everything that happens for us and to us is going to be good. Mm -hmm. But that's not what that means. That means that there are going to be some things that are going to have to labor okay. together. They're going to have to come together and clash so that, that the outcome of it is a good thing. I was speaking to a coworker of mine and he wanted to know why this wicked person seems to prosper so. Mm. And I said to him, I said, well, if the wealth of the wicked is laid up in store for the righteous, then the wicked have to prosper for a while so that when that time comes for you to obtain the, their wealth, they have it, huh. right? God tells the children of Israel when they were in captivity in Babylon, pray for the success of your captors. Pray for those who are doing you wrong because in their success is your success. I love that. That is such, such a powerful message and something that we should always, always keep in the back of our minds and always try to remember. Do not pray for the downfall. It's, it's a double message there. Don't pray for the downfall of your enemies. Pray for their prosperity because you never know that might just be your prosperity in the making. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, home of the next generation pastors. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Daniel Fusco, but right now I want to get back to Pastor Corey Demmel. God gives you everything you need to do what he's asked you to do. Anybody ever heard this story before today, the parable of the talents? Anybody else ever feel bad for the guy with one talent? Like, ah, oh, not fair. Do you know how much a talent is? 50 to 80 pounds of gold. You know what that equals in today's economy? About a million bucks. Still feel bad for the guy with one talent? <laughs> nope. Why? How come he only got one? How, it, you, it quickly goes from, how come he only got one talent? To like, he got a million bucks? <laughs> have you ever noticed that you can be totally okay with what you have until you notice something else that someone else has that's a little bit bigger, better, brighter, shinier, or newer? Like you get the new truck and you're like, I got the new truck. I love my new truck. My new truck's the best. And then your next door neighbor pulls in with a bigger truck that has bigger tires and it's a little bit newer and it's a little bit shinier. You're like, I hate my truck. What? Stupid truck. His truck's better. The curse of comparison is real. When we compare ourselves and our lives, you will never win that. It will always lead to superiority or inferiority and neither pleases God and neither leads to anything good in your heart or your character. So this guy who gets a talent, like, he got a million bucks. I mean, imagine if I was like, hey, I'm going to give you guys a million dollars. You'd be like, oh, we go to the best church ever. Our pastor is amazing. Like, we're going to tell everybody until you find out I gave the couple right behind you five million dollars. Like, what's the deal? Why don't you like us? All of a sudden, go from like, here's a million dollars to like, well, why didn't I get five? Like, we're just so wired that way. But we learn from this that God's going to give you what you need to do what he's asked you to do. Because some of you, God's asked you to do different things than others. And if we can stop comparing, we would be liberated from this comparison in this life of freedom. Just as the, master, the parable of the talents expects his servants to do more than passively preserve what he's been entrusted to them, so God expects us to generate a return by using our talents toward productive ends. This is what I, I find so fascinating about this story. He, think about the guy with one talent. He was called wicked, wicked and lazy. Did he lose anything? No. He just didn't use it. He didn't lose anything. He just didn't invest or use or spend it. Maybe, just maybe, God is less disappointed if we actually lost something because we were trying to bear fruit versus just digging a hole, burying it, and going, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to keep it to myself. God is less interested in what we lose and more interested that we didn't even try to invest or spend or use our gifts, our skills, our abilities, or our opportunities. Number three, speaking of which, the third thing is that we are all given different skills and abilities. All of us. We all are given 
different things, each according to his own ability. It's okay. It's okay that we're not good at everything. It's okay that, that, that there are certain things that you're wired for and other people aren't. And the more you can become okay with who you are, the more you can celebrate others who are good at things that you aren't. And you want to surround yourself with them and go, let's just do this thing together. We're all given different skills and abilities. Number four, here's the, a really important part of what biblical success looks like. And this helps us to remember, this parable remembers, we work for the master and not our own selfish purposes. We work for the master and not our own selfish purposes. The money that was given to the servants, whose was it? Master. It was his. And who did it go back to at the end? His. Nothing we have is ours. Not our money, not our kids, not our property. And, and, and we're entrusted to it while we're alive and our hearts are beating here on earth, but it really doesn't belong to us. And if you think it belongs to you, wait until you die and they give it to people you don't like. And you're like, this was never mine. Don't give it to them. That's mine. When you're dead, it doesn't matter. We're just entrusted with our property and our skills and our ability and our education and our upbringing and our opportunities. While we're here on this earth, it all belongs to the master. It's not about our selfish purposes. Really, really good topic from Pastor Corey Demel. And, you know, I just want to circle back to that curse of comparison. Like, I remember getting a brand new car and then pulling up at a red light and seeing a newer fancier, more expensive car next to me, like, oh, I can't wait to get one of those. And it wasn't until later on in life where I felt like crap forever, ever, you know, kind of uh, being ungrateful to one of God's gifts to, to me. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that we can kind of, you know, do about that? You know, it reminds me of the story of Saul and David. Okay. Saul was the king. Mm -hmm. He was the king. No <laughs> one could, could argue with that fact. Okay. Right, but David went to war and the people started singing, you know, Saul killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Mm. But I'm the king, yeah. right? And what ends up happening is we allow other people's opinion okay. to weigh in on our lives. And because in other people's opinion, you have a better car than I do, mm -hmm. now I'm comparing your car to mine. When in reality, all I need to focus on is how I can take my car and get the best use out of it. Exactly. Right. So I like that. So as far as finding yourself in a situation mm -hmm. where you've now been a little ungrateful for your gifts, what would be the best kind of recourse for that? I think the best thing to do then is evaluate your gifts. Okay. Right? And not evaluate it in a sense of what can I get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But what can people get out of it? What, what can I do to show God in my gifts? I love that. Such a cool takeaway from that sermon. Show God in your gifts and your talents. And with that being said, I want to go ahead and throw it back over to Pastor Nathan Castleberry. The job of all of these ministers is to equip the people of God to do the work of God. I've heard one pastor say it like this. In the early church, every member was a minister. So you see, my job, Pastor Chris's job, is not to do all the work for you. Our job is to point us in the right direction and say, here's the great commission. We are going to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Who's in? Here's how we do it. You see, there has to be a point where the songs that we sing and the, the words that we study and the sermons that are preached on Sundays hit the road with us on Mondays and become the way of life of God's people. Our job is not to just come here and consume ministry. Yes, we do come here to get filled up and to learn about God, but the book of James tells us that faith without works is dead. There has to be a utility to our beliefs. We come together on Sundays to get ready for Mondays. We have a local responsibility to engage in conversations about our faith. And it's our job to help instruct you and teach you and equip you to live out those principles. It's not just you waiting on us to say what the next big thing is, church. The Great Commission is on the shoulders of us all. And for those who have named Jesus the Lord of our lives, something happened at that moment when we converted to Christianity. Jesus described it as being born again. A spiritual rebirth takes place in your heart and your mind. And when that rebirth happens, the Bible tells us that we're born again with spiritual gifts. 
There are, are talents and skills that are endowed upon your existence. And when those gifts aren't being utilized inside the church and inside your community, from your cul-de-sac to your cubicle, in the sidelines at your kids' little league games, when those spiritual gifts aren't being enacted and deployed, that means that there are problems that have yet to be solved. That means there are people who have yet to be ministered to. Chris and I may be decent pastors, but we are terrible Holy Spirits. We can't be in more than one place at one time. We are not omniscient. We are not omnipresent. That's where you come in. Church, you've got to understand that, that as Christ followers, we accept it of a charge. We've accepted a commission, and it goes like this. I have a local role to play in God's global plan. Your gifts matter, your talent matters, your story matters, your presence matter. And the early church knew this. Church membership was synonymous with engagement, discipleship, living out their faith. I want you to think about the last time that you put your name in for a job or for a promotion and, and maybe you got that job and so HR came along and, and, and offered some training. That's this idea of equipping God's people for God's work. Getting fit for duty. They, they come alongside you and, and talk with you about the competencies of the role, the culture of the organization and how you fit into that chemistry and the unique role that you play. That's the pastor's job is to equip God's people for God's work. What kind of a waste would it be to get a subscription to a gym, start paying a trainer, and then you just watch that trainer do all the exercises for you? You're not gonna get any more fit that way, right? Like, I don't have a Peloton, but I'm guessing that little cycle that you've got with the iPad with the person yelling at you, if the person telling you to cycle is sweating more than you are, you might be doing it wrong, <laughs> right? Like, the job of the pastor isn't to say, hey, watch me. The job of the pastor is to say, join me. And today, I wanna invite you to join us locally in God's global plan to see people be introduced and to become fully devoted followers of him. We will be devoted through small groups, through serving, through Sunday morning services, through mission trips, through outreaches. We'll do whatever we can to equip you. All right, I'm really digging what Pastor Nathan is saying here and that's about you know, your God-given talents and, and you know, we all have something to share. And, and you, how, first of all, what is a God-given talent? Can you explain that? And how would somebody go about identifying theirs? I would say a God-given talent is something that comes to you easily. Okay. And I think the problem with that, not necessarily the problem, but the problem, the, the hard, <clears throat> uh, what makes it so hard to identify what your God-given talent is, because it's so easy to you, it's often overlooked. Okay. Right? Um, for instance, I'm a preacher. Okay. I, I a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, Give me three minutes, and I can pull an entire sermon and get it on one scripture. Okay. But that's my God-given talent, right? Yeah. There are people who have to study three and four weeks hmm. to be able to pull it together. No. There are people who can um, take a blank canvas and look at it and see a masterpiece. Hmm. And then there are other people who can't draw a decent circle. Yeah. I can't do a stick figure. Yeah. So that, that's kind of why, that's, that's, those are what God-given talents are. Those are things that come naturally to you uh, okay. without any effort, but they're often overlooked because they come so natural to you. Ah, all right. I think I understand now. So, hey, just because it's easy to you doesn't mean that that's not a super-duper cool talent to the rest of us. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take another break, but we'll be right back with more Ammo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing you next generation pastors from across the country. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Nathan Castleberry, but right now, I wanna get back to Pastor Daniel Fusco. Like I remember growing up in New Jersey, super hot, humid summers and freezing cold winters were normal. And now, because I live in the Northwest, I'm just a wimp. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like I, was, I was just telling someone earlier, my family's like, when are you going to come visit? I, I never come in winter and I never come in summer. 
because I don't want to be in hot, humid weather, and I don't want to be in freezing cold weather. And I'm like, but I grew up in this. But you get climatized, don't you? Like, it becomes normal. Like, for it's raining out here. Like, it's not raining. It's just winter, right? Someone else, they show up from California. They're like, oh, my gosh, it's so moist here, right? <laughs> because you get, you, you get used to the climate. And in the same way, when you're walking in darkness, you become acclimated to dark walking. And then once you leave the darkness and you begin to walk in the light, you become acclimated to walking in the light. For many of us, it's, you know what it's like to look back on a past that was so messed up that you feel like a different person. You're like, I don't know that person. Like, I remember that person, but it's me, but it's like a whole other life. Because you become acclimated now to walking in the light. But what's amazing is, is that when you walk in the light, notice what it says. I think this is really beautiful. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. It began with fellowship with God who is light. But then when we walk in light, then we get to have True fellowship with one another. And really, what this means is that the, the people of God, the church, the fellowship that we have, it's not like any other set of relationships. Because this is a relationship that was born in the light, God's light that he shares with us. And then as we walk in the light together, we get to share fellowship with one another. So sometimes we say, man, the church is good for community. It is, but it's a community unlike any other community because it's a community that's born in the light. Now, I want you to take a moment, just look around the sanctuary for a second. Go ahead, look around. For those of you who are joining us online, I want you to just look at your screen. But just imagine all the different people who are, who, who are, who are around there. This is not like any other community. Because, like, you can, you can go to a sporting event, and there's people from all different age places and, and, and different styles and all that. But this is not like a sport. This is a community that is born in light. Like, we get to have fellowship with one another because God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And we begin to walk in the light. And as we walk in the light, now all of a sudden we have fellowship with one another. We get to truly know one another. And it doesn't matter how you vote. And it doesn't matter what your history is. It doesn't matter what you failed at or how long your rap sheet is or if you were the most moral person next to Jesus himself who ever lived because of God's light and we're in fellowship with God. Now all of a sudden we're in fellowship with one another and we get to love one another even in the midst of our differences. But what's amazing is, is that what I'm always learning is that where when darkness begins to creep in, it starts to pull fellowship apart. Right? And the thing is, is it's, there's all of us, we can, if we're not careful, our own darkness begins to break fellowship. It can happen in friendships, it can happen in marriage, it can happen in families, it can happen on the job, where before you know, we start harboring resentments or hurts. We begin putting suspicion in the gap when we don't understand what someone's doing or why. And before you know it, we start walking in darkness a little bit and things start to come apart. But when we walk in the light as he is in light, not only do you get that fellowship with one another, it says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow. I want you to notice the verb in that. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what, what does it do? Cleanses. Does it say cleansed in the past? No. It says it's in the present tense. He's cleansing us now. Now, what does, it doesn't mean that Jesus' salvation is progressive and it takes, but what it's saying is that the, the application of the purification that happens to us when the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life happens as we walk in community together. We get to experience it together. Like, and that's the beauty of the people of God. That's the beauty of what Christmas is about because as you walk in fellowship with one another because of your fellowship with God who is the light, you begin to see people change. And sometimes the application in experience of the finished work of Jesus happens 20 years in the journey following Jesus. That's why, what do I always say here? We're all in what? Process. But that process comes with fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. And then all of a sudden you see people change. And that's why God wants us to 
to hope with one another and to walk with one another through the, the messy times and the good times. Instead of just what happens if something gets messy, we have a tendency to want to break things apart. But God's like, no, 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 listen, maybe this is the time, this part of the character of God, God's gonna put on display in our hearts. Can we hang in there long enough? Can there be enough friction so that it happens? But, but here's the thing. The church is a group of people who Jesus has cleansed by his own blood. And this, we never want to miss this. The idea of the blood of Jesus, it speaks of his death. Right? Jesus' death, the, the shedding of his blood. Sometimes people, like, they get really kind of ritualistic about it. We're like, oh, like, we need to talk about the blood of Jesus. The blood. It speaks about his death. Right? And when somebody believes in Jesus, you're believing that God sent Jesus to die in your place. And when a person exercises faith, the blood of Jesus now gets applied to our life. Jesus' death stands in the place where my death deserved. I deserved it. My mistakes were punishable by death. And we trust in Jesus. That's how a person is saved. You're not saved by getting better. All right, Pastor Fusco, wrapping it up. And, you know, he's 100% correct about this whole climate thing and, and being yes. affected and becoming, like, kind of climatized, you know. So, quick story. I had a friend. You know, I used to run in some real kind of crazy neighborhoods here in New York in the five boroughs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after God changed my life, after mm -hmm. I found God or God found me, mm -hmm. I ran into a friend, and, and I remember, distinctly remember him saying to me, like, Bro, you're not real anymore. He's like, why are you smiling all the time? And I, it blew my mind. I'm like, bro, you don't want to be happy? Like, that offends you that I'm happy? So how do we help someone that is so, like, stuck in their environment and, and their, their kind of way of thinking? How do we help them kind of see that it's so much better on this side of things? So I like to think of it this way, right? Let's say you're in a dark room. Okay. Right? Your eyes have become accustomed to being mm. in the dark, right? Okay. You can even somewhat see things, or in your head you can see it, right? Because you're not really seeing the details yes. because there's no light. But if I come in that room and I just flip on the light switch, it's going to hurt your eyes. Mm. I have to slowly intensify the light. Oh, okay. Right? It's easier for you to accept something when it's uh, slowly given to you. Okay. Rather than forced in your face, right? So if I come in the room and I start off with a little bit of light. Yeah. And I gradually bring in more light. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a easier way for you to acclimate than for me to just expect you to just take the bright light. I love that comparison. I never even thought about that before, about how somebody, if somebody is, and literally walking in darkness just to shed light on them, it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt a little bit. So let's try not to hurt our friends. Let's try to ease them into the fray a little bit. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. So success starts with this almost kindergarten idea that it seems like we get so sophisticated that we have a tendency to graduate from, that it starts with really knowing God, not just going to church, not checking a religious box, but having a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, which Cindy just said, all other gods are like, hey, here's how you get to me, and God's like, listen, I'll just come to you because y'all are messed up, so I'll do all the work which is the, the beauty of the gospel. And he says that you would just know me. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you. I'm going to cover your shame. I'm going to pay for all your mistakes. I just want to know you. All right, Pastor Corey Demo wrapping it up for us. And as we do at the end of every show, I like to ask our guest pastor to give the folks at home a, a Bible scripture or a passage from the Bible that kind of goes with that clip that we just watched. Okay, I want to use the scripture that Pastor Corey Demo used, uh, John 17 and 3. This is eternal life, that that they would know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ who sent him. It's like real success. The only real success is having that personal relationship with God because when you have that relationship with God, everything you do, he calls us to prosper. I love it. 
Pastor Emmanuel, thank you so much for being here again. Thank you for having me. Promise me you'll come back again? I certainly will. All right, awesome. And to our partnering churches, Cape Christian Church with Pastor Corey, Mountain Lake Church with Pastor Nathan, and Crossroads Community Church with Pastor Daniel Fusco. Thank you guys for those inspiring messages. To see the complete sermons and other great sermons, head over to ambotv.com. We always have great content there for you guys. Have we ever failed you? And sign up for our daily newsletter. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and Spotify. And thank you guys for watching. Good night. I love you and I'll see you next week.